Hey guys, uh, welcome to the stream. Uh, I'm going to be screencasting my uh, Code Jam 2020 round e, Kickstart round E uh, today. Uh, and I thought that just because it's, you know, not as big a, uh, it's not as competitive of a contest, uh, I thought I'd try uh, experimenting with doing a little more commentary live as I code. Um, so that's what I'm going to be trying to do uh, over this screencast. Um, you can see that there are, you know, 10 minutes before the start of the round. Um, and I thought, um, because I've seen some people ask, uh, I might as well take a little bit of a chance to uh, kind of explain some of my setup. Um, so overall, all of my, you know, code is stored in this uh, in this terminal. Hopefully you guys can see this terminal a little bigger. Uh, I don't normally like it with the font this big, but because I'm trying to explain things, I'll, uh, I zoomed in a little bit and uh, hopefully it's a little easier to read. Um, but my code is, you know, kind of all organized into the folders under like my programming, under programming. Um, I have like a different folder for each contest. Um, so I'm going to, you know, make a directory for this contest. E. Um, and yeah. And so the way I actually make problems is, uh, in, is, uh, kind of interesting. Um, I have the script that I, I have. I have this. I wrote this script called makeprob.sh uh, that I use to uh, to generate prompts. And essentially, all it does is it takes like this template directory I have, and it copies all the files in. Uh, and the template directory uh, is lives in tilde programming slash dot template, and it contains like a CPP uh, template file, uh, a make file, and uh, and like another quick script that I use to run some other setup. Um, if you, the most, the most interesting thing part, part of this is probably my, the make file. Um, this is a make file that does a lot of different things. Um, the, the first thing is that it includes a bunch of compile flags. I try and compile with a lot of flags and as many warnings as I can. Um, and then it contains uh, a lot of, uh, it contains like a way to automatically run tests. So I can type make test and it automatically will run tests for, uh, for all of the test cases that I have downloaded. Um, it looks for files that are named like test.in and test.out or something.in and something.out. Uh, and what it does is it runs, it pipes the input in, the in file in, uh, it generates a .res file, uh, I guess for, it stands for .result, uh, and then it diffs it against dot, the, the .out file. And all of this is, uh, all of this makes it really easy for me to test all my code. Um, you can actually find, uh, you can actually find a lot of this at gist.github.com. Uh, I've uploaded a lot of uh, this make file to uh, to the to here, so you can actually go and you know look at uh, all of this, look at all of this code, and kind of see how it works. So that's pretty cool. Uh, another thing I started using recently uh, is I started using Competitive Companion. Um, this kind of just uh, speeds up. Uh, this kind of just speeds up the task of downloading the sample cases. Uh, it's just a browser extension, and it has built-in support for a lot of different things like um, C Helper and J Helper. And a lot of people like to use those, but I am not a huge fan of these. Uh, they're all kind of like a little bit too heavyweight for my liking. And so I also just wrote kind of a, a simple version of this on my own. It's just a quick Python script. Uh, it's called like download prob.py. Um, and it just like spins up the server uh, and it listens on like a custom port for a competitive companion uh, in order to in order to download all this sample data. Um, so there are a few different commands. Uh, and because everything of mine is set up on the command line, uh, I kind of just run these once at the start of the contest uh, and then, uh, and then uh, have all of my setup uh, ready to go. Um, I had a few other questions about like my desktop. Uh, this computer is running uh, Arch Linux. Um, it's running Arch Linux with i3 uh, window manager. Uh, i3 is this tiling window manager, which means that like my windows are automatically always like full screen. I can do things like I can switch between tab view and split view. Um, I can open new windows and it automatically like, splits the space. Um, and all of this is kind of just it makes it more convenient to use. Um, uh, the fact that this is a Linux computer also makes it easier to code and ha you have a familiar environment with G++ and everything kind of uh, automatically installed. Um, so I think that's that's most of that. Um, I guess I can also spend a little time right now talking about some of my vimrc. Um, let me just make a quick problem just to give an example. Um, when I run tilde programming make problem.sh foobar, it creates a problem, a folder named foobar uh, that contains all my code. Uh, and it's pre-populated with um, some not, uh, most. the most important one is just this make file and foobar.cpp. Uh, so if I open foobar.cpp, I have like nice syntax highlighting, I have uh, completion, um, 
let me see if I can, if I, I have you completely installed, uh, mm, I don't remember the commands. Yeah, YCM completer, uh, which can, uh, which gives me like nice syntax highlighting and, uh, and, uh, uh, gives me also diagnostics. So while I'm typing, if I do something weird, like, you know, I say like int a equals one, string s equals a, uh, it'll give me an error. Uh, and if I highlight it, you can actually see in the bottom right, uh, it says like no no viable conversion. Uh, and, you know, uh, I can actually go fix that error in the editor. Um, so that's all pretty nice. Um, a lot of the setup is once again, also on GitHub. Uh, if any of you guys want to check it out, uh, if you go to my GitHub, it's slash Eknarwala. It's the normal URL, um, and uh, it's in dot files. So all of these files, all of my like Vim configuration is in dot files. A lot of these are actually not used anymore, um, but the Vim ones are still used. Um, and if you go to like the Neo Vim config, um, you can find all of this config. Um, most of the important one is just installing for most of the important stuff for um, uh, for competitive programming is really just you complete me, uh, which makes Vim a lot more like an IDE where you can actually syntax check your C++ code. Um, yeah, so I think that's most of what I wanted to go over before the contest. Um, let me know in the comments if you have any other questions. Uh, I might, you know, do another stream and, you know, keep talking about this. Um, but until then, we have, uh, you know, four more minutes uh, to kind of just to chill before the start of the contest. Um, so I guess I will just get a little mentally prepared. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess I might as well show off what some of the capabilities of my, like, of how I'd, like, download problems. Um, Competitive Companion is this Chrome extension that uh, has a lot of functionality. It does handles a lot of these, uh, handles a lot of different, uh, handles a lot of different per judges and handles a lot of sites um, to download things. Uh, and it's the one that's responsible for actually parsing this HTML and stuff. Um, for me, I just like spin up this download uh, thing and I tell it whether I want to download a problem or a contest or uh, or whatnot. Uh, here, let's say I want to download a contest with three tasks. Uh, I'm actually just going to name the tasks ABC. Um, and then if I start this, then it'll just start listening. Uh, and then I can click this, click competitive companion on each of the problems. Uh, and then it will download the tasks uh, in a way that is easy for me to solve. Uh, and it, you know, runs make prop and stuff and generates all my make files. Um, so this is all kind of a pretty ad hoc setup. Um, I think if, if you want to make your own, you should definitely make your own. Um, there are a lot of like more full featured and more well-tested setups. Um, but this is kind of convenient and pretty lightweight, uh, and that's why I use it. Another thing I've recently started doing is uh, using Ascinema. Uh, in addition to recording my screen with OBS, I've started using Ascinema to record um, to record my contests, it, like pretty much it records like a, a terminal session and it's able to play it back without, um, play it back, back directly into a terminal. Uh, and the benefit of this over like a screen recording is that it's a lot smaller. It's really just stores just the text uh, that, that changed on the screen and stuff. So it's definitely a lot simpler. Uh, and you know, it, it seems like it's maybe small enough to like upload somewhere, uh, uh, upload somewhere kind of in a small format. Um, if I get around, if I get around to kind of finding a way to uh, finding a place to upload all my solutions and stuff to, uh, I'll, I'll try and upload these uh, so that if any of you guys can play it back if you want. Um, but between this and the uh, screencast, hopefully it gives you a good sense of, you know, how I approach these, how I approach these contests. So we have a minute left before the contest. Um, and yeah, we'll see how it goes. I'm not too sure how many people are going to be doing this. Um, Kickstart is a round that's typically that Google runs. Um, they run several rounds per year. It's typically aimed at like, uh, I think it's uh, typically aimed at like college and university students. Um, there's one of their big pushes to kind of get more people into competitive programming. And uh, it's also one of their big recruiting tools um, for kind of uh, newer programmers uh, and, you know, like 
undergrads and stuff. Um, and so, uh, and so there's not, there's not any like real prizes for it. Like there are for code jam. It's kind of like code jam light. Um, but I think the rounds are still pretty fun to do. Um, and it's a good chance to kind of just do live rounds. Uh, I think doing live rounds is definitely a lot more exciting than doing virtual rounds and doing problems afterwards. Um, so I, I think, um, despite there not being like prizes or like any rating or anything, um, it's still pretty fun to compete. Um, and, uh, it'll be a cool chance that I can, you know, kind of take it a little lighter and maybe explain some of my thought processes in more detail while I solve these problems. Another thing, uh, I typically solve, uh, solve these problems with a whiteboard. Uh, I have a whiteboard over here on this wall. Um, and, uh, I really like using a whiteboard just because there's a lot of space to write and you can, you know, kind of change your ideas. But for this time, I don't have time to set up a camera for the whiteboard. So instead, I'll just try doing, working things out more in my text editor and using that as kind of um, a way to write down my thoughts and kind of explain it as I go. So we're almost, contest is almost going to start. Uh, I'm going to set it up to download four prompts. And uh, let's open them up. Uh, I'm just going to open them up and download them really quickly so that I uh, have them all ready. Uh, that way I don't have to worry uh, later. Uh, it's kind of surprising that all the problems are s taking so long to load. Uh oh. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I'm going to kind of start them downloading. Uh, and then I can go read the tasks slowly uh, while these files are getting created, while the samples are getting downloaded. So an arithmetic array is an array that contains at least two integers and the difference. Okay, so arithmetic arrays are just arrays where uh, like there's a common difference and a sum. The whole thing has to be an arithmetic array. Uh, you wanna choose a contiguous arithmetic subarray that has a maximum length. Um, so the way that this works is arithmetic subarrays, one way to look at it is by looking at the differences. Um, So a subarray, so max, the max arith subarray equals max equal subarray in the differences. Uh, and so that's what we're going to take. Um, kind of this is a, it tells us that you know, it's when the differences between consecutive elements are equal, so we're just going to do that. Um, we're going to read in the input. Note that the input size is 1 in 9, so maybe we should use N64T just to be safe. This is just a quick way to read in a whole vector. When you compute the difference array, um, we're gonna just compute the maximum length of a contiguous array. Um, note that n is at least two, so it's good that d is not empty. So we're gonna do this. i is less than n minus one, i plus plus. And equals one, curves the length up until like d0. Uh, so if di equals di minus one, curve plus plus, else curve equals one, and c equals the max. Uh, and so I can type make test and it just immediately makes tests for me, uh, runs all the tests for me. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to get ready to submit, and let's just submit this in. Cool. Um, so, problem B. We can refresh this and see if it passes. Might as well also check this. So there are people who have solved this way faster than me. leftmost point of the campus um, and look towards the right. So there are n buildings in line, the height. 
of building X is visible if there's only no building that is. Okay. Um, if there's only no, if there's no building to the left that is strictly higher. So if there are two, if there are ties in there, it's, it's actually visible from both sides. That's interesting. Um, A buildings and B buildings. There are C buildings visible to both of them. So the buildings that are visible to both of them must be like tied for the max. Um, okay. Um, We might as well assert these just to make sure so that just for mental um, the idea is that all the buildings that are in the middle are going to be double counted and then we need a buildings on the left and b buildings on the right that are like all like slightly lower and then um, everything else needs to get hidden so we'll just put it at a low height um, what are we supposed to output we're supposed to output like either impossible or or an actual output. so the no minimum number of buildings is uh, n is a minus c it's a plus b minus c because those are like the number of buildings uh like the number of buildings that each sees uh so if this thing is greater than n that means that we don't have enough buildings so we'll count impossible otherwise Otherwise, if um, we'll push back twos for the things that A can see, the middle will be C's which will be height three, and then we'll push a bunch of buildings with height two on the other side. And then this is gonna be if A minus C, the other thing is that there has to be, um, okay, so res.insert, res.begin, So if c equals 1 and a equals b equals 1, then it's impossible as well. Or a equals b equals 1 and c equals 1 and n greater than 2. So if all three of these are 1, then if these things are if there's only one thing that we're allowed to see and n is at least two, then it's impossible. So if n, n is greater than a plus b minus c, extra equals n minus We're gonna insert a bunch of buildings of height one. Now we're just gonna say four and i equals zero as n i plus plus count is i. So one thing I can do, I like to do sometimes is like if the if there are multiple possible answers, I'll make it so that my diff doesn't cause me to fail tests. Um, it kind of just runs the same code, um, but it means that it will run all the tests regardless of whether it passes or whether uh, there are cases or not. Um, and so it looks like I'm just printing different results. Um, at a glance, the results still seem fine, so I'm just going to um, submit it. Uh, one other thing I just saw is that the height must, the integer y must be the height of the building in meters between one through n. Um, so I think I'm just going to special case uh, the n equals one and n equals two case. So if uh, the n less than or equal to three case. if n is less than three. So if n equals one,
n equals two, then we'll just you know print one. If n equals two, if a equals if a equals two, then we'll print one two. Else, so if both can see both, then we'll print one one. Else, if a equals two, okay. Um, and the reason that we can assert false there is because it should have been taken care of in this impossible case. Um, so let's just submit this and hope that it passes. Don't have time to really check my work here. We need to take care of this case because you know if the sizes are small, then yeah, um, it's still running, which is usually a good sign. Uh, typically, like once something like runs into an error, and then it stops running, so you can tell. N toys number from one through n. Each toy has two properties. Wrong answer. All right. Well, then we should we should figure this out. It's not it's not runtime error, which means the assert false didn't fail. If a plus b minus c is greater than n. n equals 1, then we'll just print 1, right? n equals 2, because all of these have to be 1. If n equals 2, If n equals two, then we do this thing. Um, so I did pass samples. That's one thing I can tell. The heights of the building are visible. So well, the first, third, and fourth buildings are visible. Just yeah. So if there's only one tallest building, then that's not possible because yeah, because like A has to be able to see everything from the left and B has to be able to see the first thing on the right. So there's no way to, um, there's no way for that to be a problem. Um, I think I might have screwed this up. I think it might just be this. Um, insert. If I look at vector insert, I think one thing I might have screwed up is I might have, yeah, you need to count, give the count first and then the value. Uh, and so it looks like I just inserted the wrong number of, I just inserted the wrong number of extra things. Like I, I inserted one thing with value extra instead of extra things with value one. So that was a pretty stupid mistake. The reason I can insert these at here is because like the two things on either side of it are at least have, have at least height at least two. So we don't have to worry about that. All right, well, minus one attempt is not so good. Now it passed, all right, so at least I've passed this. It's two properties, uh, E, I, R, I. So you can alternate, like you spend E, I minutes playing with it and then R, I minutes forgetting and then E, I minutes playing and then R, I forgetting. He will stop and cry. So you start with you start somewhere. You play. Um, so you want to remove some toys. Uh, it looks like there's no time between playing toys, so we don't have to worry too much about that. The idea is that we want to have a bunch of toys in a circle. 
you play with each of them for EI minutes, and then since he finished playing with it, um, so the idea is that like we're always just going to keep going in the circle. So like we might as well just it, it doesn't there's we don't have to worry about this condition with like he's hasn't forgotten it about about it yet or whatever um, because we can just pretend that he like he's going to keep playing with them forever and like. We're just trying to find the first time that he will cry. So we can just change the condition from he will stop and cry to just he will cry. Um, and have him just always play the toys. Um, so overall, this means that you have a circle and you have a cycle um, cycle width, length, some EI, the sum of the EI. Um, we might as well use the EI plus RI to be the time from the start, the time he first started playing with it to the time that he can't play with it next. Um, and then... Uh, we just need EI plus RI to be greater than or equal to cycle length or something. It's like min so it's going to be let C equals some chosen. We're going to choose some set of, set of the things and we're going to let C be the total amount of time that you spend cycling to, that you spend in one cycle. So if this is going to be the min of the first cry time equals first time you revisit a toy with EI plus CI RI with CI C is less than this thing which equals well we might as well visit all the other toys first so it's gonna be it will it's a revisit so we're gonna do this do this plus some EI I for toys with C which I think is just gonna be no it's gonna be no sorry it's the first time you revisit a toy with CI smaller right so um, what we're gonna do I think the idea is that what we're gonna do is um, we'll just keep considering the first toy that he's going to remove, right? Um, add toy is C is less than EI plus R. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to just maintain, like, the first toy that is bad for him. We're just going to, like, maintain a set of toys. We'll take the first toy that's bad for him. And then the the important thing to uh, to realize is that, like, by removing other toys, like, it's only going to make come to this bad toy like earlier. So there's no point in like ever like keeping this and removing other ones. So we're going to re just remove that one first. So I think that's the general approach. Uh, and just quick look at the test cases. There's just 25. So we're just going to we're just going to go for it. Um, another way to do this maybe is that Yeah, I think this is the right We're going to make these pair int 64t int so that I can sort them and then store the indices. ri.first, ri.first plus equals ei. This is because the cycle, this length is a more interesting length. And then um, ri.second, ri.second equals i. We're gonna just sum this and it's important to pass in a zero here so that we don't cause overflows inside the sum. The in sixty four T here.
We're going to store prefix ease as well. Um, I'll think about how to do this in a sec. Um, we need to, this is going to be, which is equal C plus some EI is less than E sub like earlier. So maybe we'll need a bit. Um, we'll sure why this is not compiling. Okay, there's just transient. Just a big number. Uh, we'll do one eighteen. Should be. We'll do eighty eighteen. Ah, uh, I think my cat needs to come in. We can come in. If we removed all n, then there's no point in continuing. It's like, we just can't. You'll cry immediately or something. Okay. 
Um, now we need to remove it. So pop it from this bad, and then c minus equals e of cur. Stop. from C, remove from the bit, and then do this thing again. So we might as well just do this lazily before we look up. Is bad. Alright, let's see how this thing works. Well, it looks correct. I'm just going to submit it. I don't really want to test this problem either. Now, let's go at least read the last problem while we wait for this one to judge. Oh, it passed. Great. Um, so now we're definitely in the lead. Um, Geothermal looks like has already solved this problem in only 18 minutes. Um, so there's a good chance that we can finish this out. Okay, Leopold's friend Kate likes stones, so he decides to buy her a gold stone as a gift. S types of stones, some types of stones are available free of charge. So we're given a graph uh, with uh, that's undirected, two-way streets. Uh, zero or more types of stone are available in unlimited supply. Okay, so you you can go go to places you can collect stones. stones of types okay does not want to carry carrying a stone across the street costs him one unit of energy I see so um, so he has to have all the stones at one junction and and then he is able to um, then he's able to um, create, then he's able to do the thing. Um, so one thing is like, so how big are N and S? N and S are not big. So we could compute like for each junction the cost, pretty much like carrying stones is the only thing that's that's expensive. Um, and so we can compute for each junction what's the min cost to uh, what's the min cost to get it to any location. So I think that's probably the right thing. So I guess we'll do some kind of Dijkstra. Um, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to do things like Yeah, the idea is that we're gonna like the ten to the twelve print minus one instead. Okay, well, we're gonna compute like for the cost of have to create. Um, we're gonna cr compute the cost to create each recipe at any junction. K is, KI is a most three. Okay, well that's pretty small. Um, uh, yeah, KI is a most three, that's good. That means that we don't have to worry about things being way too expensive. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna start typing. Uh, we're gonna start off by building the graph. N, M, S, R. Vector. I'm gonna call these V, E, stones, and recipes. Um, that way I don't get accidentally get confused. Uh, I've definitely done the thing where I've used N too many in too many places, and that's always kind of that always feels pretty bad. So we're gonna do this. There are almost a hundred cases. 
Um, not super. Yeah, well, we might as well do this. Okay, so vector. So I have this tensor class, which I use to do 2D arrays. Uh, pretty much it does 2D arrays, like instead of a vector a vector, which would take up a lot of space, it does like, it's a little cheaper than that. Um, and then I'm going to do I'm going to make sure that this compiles. Okay. Um, hopefully this will compile. The Who uses which? We're going to store this because we're going to do this thing where, like, when a stone reaches a city, then we'll, like, say that it's usable for any of those. Um, Great. Now for each now we have these recipes. Starts with the number of ingredient stones, followed by k of the ingredients, and then one of the results.
Well, these are distinct, so we'll just. Just make sure that I uh, subtracted one from everything that needs subtracting one when I read the inputs. Yeah, okay. Ants equals inf. Ants equals. pq.empty Okay, now um, if d is not equal to this thing, then we continue, otherwise pq.pop, right? Um, the first thing we'll do, add it to Alright, good enough for me. 
that's called in. Well, this code is written pretty safely, so I don't really think there could be much wrong with it. Alright, I passed. Cool. Um, so yeah, this is kind of one of those examples of a problem where you kind of just run Dijkstra uh, along a more complicated graph. Uh, in this case, I'll, I'll go back and, you know, now that I'm finished with the contest, I'll go back and kind of explain some of the uh, thought process. Um, before I do that, I just want to kind of check to make sure that I've kind of cinched this contest. Um, I do have some penalty. I have four minutes of penalty time. Um, so it's not until like four minutes from now that I can be 100% sure that no one is going to pass me. Um, but yeah, let me let me talk a little bit about this problem now that I'm you know done implementing it. The main idea is that um, for each type of stone to get to create one type of stone at a location like has some fixed cost. And once the stone is at this location, like we don't really care where it came from anymore. Um, this is kind of, it's like stones can't be fractional or you can't split them apart or like there's no like optimization. So if like there are some re ingredients that come together to make this stone and like the stone is made here, like we don't really care where the ingredients came from. Uh, and so that's the main idea. Like we're going to store, we're going to compute for each type of stone and for each location, how, how, uh, how much energy does it cost to make, to gra gather together enough materials for a stone at this location. Um, and so... Um, one thing that's important is that we're going to run this using like Dijkstra, um, and like all the costs are non-negative and whatever, whatnot. So, um, we're going to run this using Dijkstra just to ensure that we don't run into, uh, we always like make the cheapest things first and we don't end up having to like, you know, optimize several different things. Um, and the, uh, pretty much the idea is like, if this stone is the cheapest one to make, um, then anything that like, anything that, uh, anything else like has to it then if if we know of a way to make this stone and th and the way we know of is the cheapest out of like the way we know to make anything then we might as well just fix that in stone because nothing else is going to be able to like has negative cost and is going to be able to make that any cheaper in the future so that's the main idea for dextro um but then the other thing we store is like how many um so we need to essentially store we need to compute like two different types of transitions. One of them is um, is for each stone. Uh, if we have a stone at a location, we can just move it to a different location. So that's always pretty cheap, right? Another thing we could do is if we have a bunch, we can take a bunch of stones at one location and craft them using a recipe. And remember, like by the time these stones have gone to this location, we don't really care where they came from. Um, each of the stones had kind of had to be created independently because there's no way to like do duplicate. There's no way to like create two stones at once or anything. So those are all independent and we can just sum together, uh, their stone values. So here, a recipe dist, um, recipe dist stores the distance for, um, stores, uh, recipe dist stores like the sum of the costs for all to make the, uh, the sum of the costs for all inputs to a given recipe at a given location. Um, and so what we do is like when we get a stone, at a, when we process a stone at a location, we just add, uh, we add its own, the stone's cost to this recipe's cost. And then um, there's also the thing that, uh, and then the idea is like once we've collected uh, or like seen one of every stone, uh, seen every stone that's needed in this recipe, then we can actually uh, like execute the recipe and produce like a stone using this, the, using the total cost. And so this is kind of like, um, this is one way that like you can kind of create go from some stones at some locations to some other stone uh, to a new stone at a new location. Um, and the other way is just moving it along an edge. And so we kind of just put this all together and run it through Dijkstra, and then it all works out. Um, one thing that's really nice is they gave us this value of infinity that we can use, um, ten to the twelve. And so if we are careful with our infinities, and um, there are a few nuances with how I write Dijkstra that uh, kind of allow this to work. But if we do that, then um, then we can just actually check if our answer is infinity at the end. The way we handled that is we just initialized all the distances to infinity, uh, and that ensures that none of our intermediate values will ever get too large. Um, so that's that's that. Um, looks like we are done with this contest, um, and I believe the window has passed for any it to be possible for anyone to pass me. It's also true that for everyone else is um, everyone else also has some penalty. So. Um, I guess maybe that wasn't such a big concern anyways. But yeah, um, this is a pretty interesting contest. 
Um, I'm just going to go back through the problems one more time. So this problem, we're just going to try and identify the longest streak of um, longest streak of equal differences. Um, and the way we do that is we just store the uh, we store the The way we do that is we store like the current, the length of the current run, and then if this we can extend the run, we extend it, and otherwise we reset the length of the run to one, and then we just set the answer to the max. Um, so that's this problem. This problem we got a wrong answer on. Um, I believe that was because. Let me take a look. Let me try and remember. Uh, I think it was something pretty, pretty silly. Right. It was that I passed the, the arguments into uh, insert in the wrong order. And so what I was trying to do is I was trying to um, like insert a bunch of extra insert a bunch of extra ones in the middle, but I actually inserted a bunch of extra like inserted one number that was like one very large number, which is totally wrong. Um, this is kind of just something I guess I have to be more careful about. Uh, if there were like, you know, stronger samples, it obviously would have caught that. Uh, and another thing that you can do is you can write stronger samples yourself. Um, like you can write like n equals 100, c equals uh, c equals 1, a equals 2, b equals 1, and just make sure that that works. And that would have totally caught it. Um, another thing I could have done is kind of written an assertion. Um, but overall, yeah. you just have to be really careful about this kind of thing. Um, but I'm glad that passed. Um, the idea for this problem is just the the idea to solve this problem is that like you really don't need that many heights. Um, if the number if n is pretty small, then you can just hard code the solutions. Uh, if n is larger, then for every shared thing, you put it in the middle as a big streak of um, of really tall buildings. Things that only a can see, you have a streak of buildings of height two, and streak things that only b can see, you have a streak of buildings of height one. And then everything that neither of them can see, you can just put like a bunch of ones in the middle uh, so that neither of them can ever see it. And it doesn't really matter where you insert them as long as it's not on the either end. Um, so thinking through this math, um, you kind of can develop some intuition. Uh, this is there's actually a there's actually a puzzle type that's kind of similar to this called skyscrapers, um, which can help. Toys. Um, this is kind of an interest. This was actually a pretty interesting problem. Um, it was. It took me, yeah, it took me, like, twelve minutes, thirteen minutes to solve. Um, it was pretty. It wasn't. It wasn't trivial. Um, and yeah, the way you'd, uh, the way you approach this problem is, you know, by, uh, you approach this problem just taking, uh, what am I saying? You, you approach this problem by like deleting things, iterative, deleting like the cheapest thing, uh, kind of, the idea is that like, the idea is that having more toys is almost always good, except when it's the toy that, uh, the toy that causes him to cry. So you might as well like delete the toy that causes him to cry. Um, before deleting any other toys, uh, and by doing that, you can like delete the toys one at a time, and uh, the answer will be correct. Yeah, it looks like a lot of other people had D's that were like faster than mine by a little bit. I took about fifteen minutes. Looks like William Lin took like only like thirteen. Um, no, I took. So it was definitely a little bit slower. I guess it wasn't too big a gap. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty much it for this video. Uh, I think I'm gonna call it here. Um, thank you guys for watching and hope you liked it.